Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Carolyn and I work on EcoJustice's communications team and I'll be helping running I'll be helping to run today's webinar along with my colleague, Laura, who's uh, working with me behind the scenes. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining from the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Uh, these territories are also known as Vancouver. And as a settler of Chinese and European ancestry, I recognize that being on the land in a good way uh, really starts with educating myself about the history of colonization in Canada and indigenous rights and governance and uh, importantly, uh, justice. And I wanna invite uh, you joining us today, everybody joining us today to please uh, use the chat and uh, you might share whose territory you're calling in from. And as people continue to log on, uh, I'm gonna take a moment just to go over a couple of housekeeping items and let you know how things are gonna unfold in our webinar today. Uh, so we're going to have a conversation first between our guest speakers, and we have time set aside at the end for uh, your questions. And uh, it's going to be, a, I expect, a, an organic conversation. We've planned for it to run uh, for one hour, uh, but if it runs a bit longer, I want you to know that we're recording the session. And, and so I'm saying that just to invite you to relax and take care of yourself if you need to step away for a moment or if you need to log off a bit early, uh, we will post the webinar recording to our website so you'll be able to catch what you missed there and we'll also send out a link to you by email. And and so for the question and answer period, uh, I'd like to just say that um, we're going to, I'm going to ask that you use the Q&A function in Zoom to submit your questions to panelists at any time uh, throughout today's session. Um, if you have a question for a specific speaker, uh, you can use the at symbol and then the speaker's name. And the, the Q&A function is distinct from the chat. I should probably point out where you can find that. So if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, um, you should see a Q&A icon. And if you uh, click on that, uh, a window will open and that's where you can type in and submit your questions. We'll be monitoring the chat as well, but um, really by using that Q&A function that will make sure that we see your questions because the chat um, activity in the chat can sometimes get quite busy. So I just wanna make sure that we don't miss, uh, miss your question. And just a, a friendly reminder to be socially responsible community members, uh, just please keep your comments kind and respectful and, and on the topic. And for those of you who are new to EcoJustice, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our organization. EcoJustice's mission is to go to court and use the power of the law to defend nature, combat the climate crisis, and fight for a healthy environment for all. At EcoJustice, we know from experience that the law is one of the most direct and powerful tools we have for building a brighter environmental future. And as you'll hear today, our laws reflect and shape the values we share as society and establish those ground rules that we're all supposed to follow when it comes to defending the environment and the health of our communities. And I think that's a good time for me to introduce you to today's panelists. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin is EcoJustice's uh, first staff lawyer in Newfoundland and Labrador. And I'd also like to welcome Dr. David Boyd, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, and sorry, on Human Rights and the Environment. And he's also uh, an Associate Professor of Law, Policy and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Elaine McDonald is joining us as well. And Dr. Elaine is EcoJustice's Healthy Communities Program Director. And Last but not least, Dr. Jane MacArthur, the Toxics Campaign Director at the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, um, also known as CAPE. So welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Um, I'm going to hand things over to you, Caitlin, and I'll uh, jump back on a little bit later on. Thanks so much, Carolyn, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so glad to see so many folks joining in here from all across Turtle Island. Uh, I'm being in to you from the sacred and ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose culture has been forever erased by colonial violence. I am grateful to live and work on the island of the Ungup, the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq, and fortunate enough to work with the Inu of Nitsinan and Inuit of Nanatsiwut and Nunatuwut who collectively host what is now referred to as Newfoundland and Labrador. The First Nations and Inuit communities here have always been leaders in the environmental rights movement and truly conceptualized rights to healthy environment long before settler uh, environmentalists and academics coined this term. So we're here tonight because Canada is just on the cusp of catching up to these Indigenous leaders and recognizing the right to a healthy environment in federal law. So in April, EcoJustice and our partners, including CAPE, which stands for Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, welcomed the introduction of Bill C-28. And Bill C-28 is meant to modernize the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, or CEPA, which is argu arguably Canada's most important environmental law. And it's been 21 long years since CEPA was significantly updated or amended. And given that this law uh, sets out how we protect human health and the environment from dangerous pollution and toxic chemicals, it desperately needed to be updated to address today's environmental health threats. Um, Bill C-28 includes amendments to CEPA that recognize for the first time in federal law, the right to a healthy environment and elements of environmental justice. So these are very exciting developments in the area of environmental law. And I personally have so many questions. I'm sure you do too. Uh, so we're gonna dig in uh, to this topic with our panelists and you'll have an opportunity to ask your questions as well. But um, let's get started. Uh, my first question is uh, for David. I expect that some of the folks who are tuning in today are going to be familiar with the concept of environmental, uh, sorry, rights to a healthy environment, but let's set a foundation. So we're all starting with a shared understanding. Can you tell us a bit about what the right to a healthy environment actually means? Yeah, sure, of course, Caitlin, and thanks for the question, and also really great to be joining you from Coast Salish territory here on the west coast of British Columbia. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, this concept has deep roots in Indigenous law, and you know, Canada's often, at least when I was in law school, we were taught there's two founding legal systems, the common law and the civil law, but in fact, there's a third founding legal system, which predates both of those, called Indigenous law. And environmental rights and responsibilities are at the heart of Indigenous law. If you look at uh, Professor John Borrow's amazing book called Canada's Indigenous Constitution, he identifies this idea of environmental rights and responsibilities as a bedrock concept in, that spans all of the diverse Indigenous cultures of Canada. Um, and so when we talk about its recognition in Western societies, um, it's really been around for almost 45 years now, first in Portugal's constitution in 1976, Spain in 1978. And the right to a healthy environment basically has two main components. It has a substantive component and a procedural component. And the substantive co component are the things that we would all think of as fundamental to human health and well-being: Clean air, safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainably produced food, a safe climate, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, and non-toxic environments where we can live, work, study, and play. And then the procedural components of the right to a healthy environment are things like access to information, public participation in environmental decision-making, access to justice and effective remedies, and of course, non-discrimination so that everyone everywhere can enjoy this fundamental human right. Just to dig in a little bit in terms of what C-28, which was only tabled back in April the 13th and unfortunately has only made it to the uh, to first reading. Um, 
but we do hope one day it'll become law. Uh, C-28 amends the Canadian Environmental Protection Act in a few different ways to recognize the right to healthy environment. Uh, the, probably the, the most important aspect is um, CEPA is an, I'm going to call it CEPA for short, which stands for Canadian Environment Protection Act, but Canadian Environment Protection Act or CEPA is an enormous piece of legislation that covers many aspects of Canadian environment and, you know, it regulates greenhouse gases, regulates pollution and toxics. It also, it's even, it is the act under which the government is going to regulate plastics, for example. So it was really important that the right be recognized in a way which would, it would apply across the entire act, throughout the entire act. So right up front in the very beginning of the act, under the administrative duties, which lays out how Canada has to implement and administer the act, the, one of the first things that is going to be that C28 does is include the recognition of right to healthy environment. However, we are concerned about some of the language that has been put forward in that section in terms of, uh, and I'll convey it to you, protect the right of every individual in Canada to a healthy environment as provided under the act. However, they add on to that clause, some qualifying language would allow them to bounce that right against economic interests. And that is something that we will be seeking to hopefully amend uh, when we have the chance, when the bill eventually advances to a committee stage when, in, when amendments can be put forward. So that's kind of the first place, place where we see the right to healthy environment recognized in C-28. There's another section which requires the government to establish an implementation framework for, which would describe how the right to healthy environment would be administered or applied throughout the act. And that the specific language in that section requires it to include concepts of environmental justice and non-regression and non-discrimination, which we think, um, you know, which is very encouraging to us. It tells us kind of the direction they want to go with establishing the right under the act. Um, one of the downsides is that implementation framework could take up to two years to come forward. So we're hoping to press for that implementation framework to come around, come to be published and finalized sooner so that we can start to apply it under SEPA. But we also want to see some enforcement of the right, some enforcement provisions with respect to the right under SEPA. As David mentioned, you know, part of um, the right to healthy environment is ensuring that we have access to the courts and we have ability to uh, hold the government accountable and to enforce the right. So we're actually looking at proposing some language which would add some enforcement provisions into, a, into the right to healthy environment within SEPA. Um, there's a few other amendments we're gonna be seeking to strengthen the, the recognition of the right under the acts, particularly with respect to some of the sections which where, where key decisions are made with respect to toxic substances, uh, or to ensure that um, the, the um, it is as strong as it can be, but uh, the kind of those are the main pieces in terms of how it will be included within the act. That gives us a really uh, helpful framework uh, in terms of where this is going to be integrated across the, this piece of legislation and um, sort of wanting to dig in a little bit into how chemicals and pollutants are actually impacting people in their day to day. So kind of how this uh, piece of legislation really moves into the real world. Um, so I'm going to throw it to Jane just to let us know a little bit. I understand you've done some research into uh, women who were exposed to breast cancer risk, and we'd love to know a little more about, uh, about your research. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I'd first like to acknowledge that I'm living and working virtually on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. The region also was a terminal on the Underground Railroad uh, Road Network, a place where African American people came in their escape from slavery. Uh, this area is generally referred to today as Windsor Essex, southwestern Ontario. Um, and as part of my land acknowledgement, I'd just like to also note that Indigenous women have been at the forefront of human health and environmental movements and this need to collect data and to study and understand marginalization and vulnerabilities that are created in our communities to health impacts. So as far as um, the research that I've been involved in, um, I've been a part of a number of research projects that have primarily focused on the relationship between cancers and specifically breast cancer and environmental exposures. So when I say environmental, I'm referring not only to the external outside environments, which is what we often think of when we say environments, but also our work environments, our home environments, and even our first environment, the womb. Um, so the research that I've been part of has examined the links between exposures to air pollution, pesticides and herbicides, plastics and components of plastics, substances in our personal care products. 
More specifically, um, I was involved in a series of research projects over the course of a decade and with several thousand women in Windsor, Essex, um, where we found elevated breast cancer among women who lived and worked in um, agricultural or farming operations, in particular with early life exposures uh, in agriculture, women who worked in auto manufacturing uh, and plastics manufacturing, the pieces of the cars that are made of plastic, in food canning operations, cans that are, are coated in plastic coatings that contain endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, among hairdressers where there's a mix of toxic substances, and more recently, I completed research with women workers at the Ambassador Bridge border crossing in Windsor. And that's a bridge that connects Windsor, Ontario, Canada with Detroit, Michigan in the United States. It's the busiest border crossing in North America. More than 40,000 commuters, tourists and diesel trucks are carrying about $325 million worth of goods across the Windsor Detroit border each day. So you can imagine the, you know, the trade and economic implications of these operations. Um, because of this kind of traffic, the bridge environment has heavy air pollution uh, from the trucks and the other vehicle traffic, but it's also located in a heavily industrialized region on both the Canadian and American sides of the border. And I was drawn to the research there because women workers there were reporting high incidence of breast cancer. However, those numbers of breast cancer cases have never been formally documented despite calls to do so. So that's some of the data that we need to be collecting. Uh, this is a group of women who are facing high rates of illness and disease. And based on the anecdotal reporting of the women uh, that I interviewed at the bridge, what we're looking at there is an incidence of breast cancer among that population that would be about 47 times higher than we would expect compared to the rest of the women in this county. Um, and it wasn't just breast cancer that the women at the bridge reported to me in that research. They also talked about uh, high rates of thyroid disease, other reproductive system cancers, infertility, miscarriages, men with breast cancer, men with brain cancer, testicular cancer, their children's birth anomalies. And so part of the challenge at the bridge is that this is considered an occupational environment. And incidentally, um, the workers' claims for compensation for breast cancer have been denied, despite known breast carcinogens in diesel exhaust. And so also you can imagine that the people who live in the neighborhoods around the bridge and along the bridge, along that truck corridor, they're being exposed to these, uh, you know, the, the, uh, not only the pollution from the trucks and the vehicles, but also that same uh, air shed of industrial exposures. And these are neighborhoods uh, where they're highly populated by racialized people, people who recently migrated to Canada, international students, because it's around the University of Windsor, many people living in poverty. And so there's higher rates of many diseases and the hospitalization data is part of what tells us that health story. Unfortunately, the federal government is building another bridge to accommodate more truck traffic. <laughs> and the workers and the people living in that region are deeply concerned that they're not being protected from the toxic exposures and rightly so. Um, and ongoing development in this region fails to consult with the community members, including First Nations communities, so it's hard not to conclude when faced with these realities that these people are being systematically denied their right to a healthy environment. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Thank you for, for sort of laying that out. And you started to, to dig into some of the various different examples here. And I'm, um, I'm wondering if you can uh, help us to kind of zoom out a little bit from the sort of specifics into how this um, these findings uh, relate to issues of uh, right to envir healthy environment and uh, environmental justice and like a public health uh, sort of more broadly. Um, yeah, I wonder if you can get into that for us, please. Sure, yes. So I, I think if, again, if we look at the examples that I just described, where people in their living and working environments are being denied a healthy environment. That's both a public health issue and an environmental justice problem. I think we can look at it this way. The environments we live, work and play in and the exposures in those environments are not necessarily a matter of individual choice. We often frame health and environment issues as behavioral choices or as problems of lifestyle or of individual behaviors. But this approach ignores the facts that we don't all have access to the same lifestyle. 
And so where we live and the exposures in our neighborhoods and even our homes are often involuntary exposures. In other words, we can't control them. So the jobs we have, the exposures in our workplaces are often outside of our individual control. The power to control these lies outside the individual and often within the laws, the regulations, the policies and the economic and social systems. So when we're talking about public health and justice, these are really questions of populations and of factors that include social and structural determinants of health. And these determinants often reveal inequities that are built into our social structures. Um, so that includes things like income, access to social services, protections, education, employment, job security, um, racism, sexism, discrimination, access to affordable health services. So if I can't afford to live in a house in a neighborhood that isn't in close proximity to industrial pollutants or to the Ambassador Bridge, that's an environmental justice problem. And if I have to work in a job where toxic chemicals are part of my daily working conditions, that's an environmental justice problem. These are all structural determinants of health. And that's where when we're talking about a right to a healthy environment, we're talking about more than just toxic exposures. We're talking about the broader conditions and the intersection of multiple environments and structures that all influence health and well-being. So the people living and working in the West End of Windsor around the Ambassador Bridge, they're dealing with the daily realities of environmental injustice in the form of involuntary exposures to air pollution. The women working in plastics manufacturing are contending with environmental injustice in their elevated rates of cancer and reproductive harm from exposures to chemicals they can't control. And agricultural families exposed to toxic chemicals in early life at specific windows of vulnerability and who go on to work in other jobs, exposing them again to carcinogens or reproductive toxins are facing the effects of cumulative and synergistic exposures associated with breast and other cancers. So there are sadly many examples. And this is why a framework of environmental justice that works to ensure the right to a healthy environment through law is needed. That's really interesting to sort of see how it ties into uh, these broader issues, systemic issues. And, and as you pointed out, some of those issues are um, legislative or law-based issues. And so I'm going to uh, actually turn over to Elaine and ask um, about how modernizing SEPA and recognizing the right to a healthy environment is going to help address some of these things to better protect vulnerable populations uh, from exposures to toxic, toxics and sort of redress some of the injustices that Jane's been speaking about. Yeah, thank you for the question, Caitlin. And just reflecting on what Jane was talking about, I think, it, you know, a lot of people have trouble getting their head around what... Um, the right to healthy environment really means. And I, if I think back to when the minister, Minister Wilkinson tabled C28, the example he actually pointed to was kind of reflecting upon this environmental justice piece. He said, this is not symbolism, which is I think something we always have to try and describe to people why it is, it is not just symbolism, how it means more than that. And then he did talk specifically about Canadians who may have greater risk of exposure or susceptibility to effects of chemicals, as well as indigenous and non-indigenous communities close to major sources of pollution. And I think it's really important to, that's kind of, that's how the minister is describing what he sees right to healthy environment meaning, or at least partially what he sees it meaning under SEPA. And if you look up the actual bill, some of what you see in the bill that reflects upon that is the first time there's an, actually an inclusion of a consideration or requirement to consider what are vulnerable populations when making decisions or applying SEPA generally. Um, vulnerable populations is being recognized right at the very beginning of the act, as well as it being a definition is being provided and the minister must consider vulnerable populations or the government of Canada, I should say, must consider vulnerable populations when they're making decisions under SEPA. And they really define vulnerable populations in kind of two major ways. There's those people that Jane was talking about who have these higher exposures because of where they live, the work they do, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're circum maybe it's the food they eat in the case of country foods for indigenous people. There's just, there's this whole, there's higher risk. There's this inequality that exists where some people are, are living in a more polluted environment than others. Um, and often those people are, often it is an environmental justice or environmental racism issue with those people. It's often racialized or low income or indigenous communities that are experiencing those higher exposures 
And the other con part of the vulnerable populations piece is that susceptibility, that health susceptibility. It could be people that have asthma. It could be people that are like women, as Jane was describing, who are of that childbearing age, who are more susceptible to certain pollutants, the impacts of certain pollutants, maybe hormone disrupting chemicals, for example. So vulnerable populations definition also recognizes that there is this biological side to vulnerability as well, that, that people have really, they can't control. It's part of their biology. So by requiring the consideration of vulnerable populations, we're hoping that it will result in stronger decisions, more bans, less chemicals being used, stronger regulations around pollution. The other part of what C28 does is it's going to require the, the government of Canada to consider cumulative effects. And this is particularly important for what we call hotspot communities, communities with high levels of air pollution. Windsor's probably one. I live in, I live in Toronto, so I'm pretty familiar with the communities in the Ontario, Southern Ontario area that have, the, have these higher levels of air pollution. You know, I could point to Sarnia where there's Chemical Valley. I can point to Windsor where there's a lot of transboundary air pollution. There's a lot of traffic from trucks from the bridges and so on, as Jane described. There's Hamilton where we have a heavy steel industry, which also has high levels of air pollution. So there's that cumulative effects piece, but cumulative effects can also be about the products you use. There's chemicals in everyday products and SEPA rather than taking a one chemical at a time approach to assessing those chemicals with the consideration of cumulative effects, it'll hopefully force the government to have to look at what the suite of exposures is that people actually have and how those exposures or how those chemicals may interact and impact our health. So that's kind of a second way. A third way, if I could point to another one, if I have time, is that for the first time, it's going to have some really strong language around prohibition of substances that have a high health impact. This is new. Um, this didn't exist before in SEPA. There was, a, there was a, a lot of focus on substances that have a high impact on the environment, but we're now going to see language around pro, 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 prohibiting certain substances that are particularly harmful to human health. And that is something that's going to require us to push on the implementation side because it only sets out the requirement for the minister to start setting regulations in that respect. But I think Jane and I are up to the task to work on that and make sure those regulations are as strong as they can be. But yes, we're going to see some new language around prohibition. We are seeing some new language in C28 for the first time about setting regulations that would prohibit substances of high health concern. And um, I'm wondering if you can give me just kind of building on that, you, you talked a few about a few examples from your experience, but how might that work, for example, with one of those communities that you've worked with? Like, what, would, what is this really going to look like in practice? Um, well, if I can, I can think about some of the work I've done uh, in the Sarnia area, where the government went through a long process of looking at chemicals that are released from refineries. And that was a process that happened under SEPA. Um, in any of the assessments that you could read on any of those substances released from refineries, you never saw mention of Am Janong, you never saw mention of, of Chemical Valley. They took this kind of general Canadian approach to looking at refineries and what they admit. They didn't do like a community-based approach. They didn't do a cumulative effects assessment. So hopefully if they were, that would be look completely different under this new regime with the requirement to consider vulnerable populations, with the requirement to look at hot spots, to consider cumulative effects. Uh, another example is something that the government can is just starting to work on is looking at this suite of what we call forever chemicals, these perfluorinated compounds. We've heard a lot of, of lot in the media about them lately because they, well, they're forever chemicals because they're so persistent, they never disappear. And they're used in all kinds of consumer products. They're used in, you know, clothing, nonstick pans. They're used in, um, they're used as stain repellents. They're even used in makeup. There was a study that just came out a couple weeks ago about them being in makeup. Um, so, and they're so persistent, they, they don't, they, and they tend to accumulate because they are persistent organic pollutants, they tend to accumulate in Northern regions, particularly in the Arctic, where they then bi bi bioaccumulate in country foods, in the foods that the, that the Northern First Nations would rely on. So there's another example where with having to consider vulnerable populations, plus there's over 4,000 of these chemicals, having to consider cumulative effects, I'm hoping that C28, when implemented, becomes law, will require the assessment of those chemicals to look very different than it would under the existing SEPA, where they tend to take a one chemical at a time approach. And, and, and out of that comes re results in hopefully prohibitions, stronger restrictions, 
stronger actions overall to protect human health and particularly vulnerable populations. Those are some really exciting prospects in terms of the, the real life implications of how this could work. Uh, and um, I'm thinking about the impacts on, on human health and public health and, and um, just wondering, Jane, uh, you're with CAPE, uh, obviously a physician-led organization. Wondering a bit about if you can tell us why, why healthcare professionals are interested, engaged in supporting this CEPA reform. Yes, thank you, Caitlin. Um, well, the name kind of gives it away. Uh, <laughs> but yes, at CAPE, we do our work at the intersection of health and environment. So as a physician-led organization, we recognize the nestedness of health. And so what that means is that health is more than a biomedical phenomenon that's specific to individual bodies. Health is influenced, as I kind of described earlier, uh, by all the environments we live in and interact with. Health is the relationships, the structures, the exposures, the social, political, and economic conditions that people move through in the course of their lives. So with that understanding, it becomes obvious that legislation is important to health. And so that's why you'll see CAPE, our staff, our board, our members, talking about climate change and its health impacts, about a healthy recovery from COVID-19, about prescriptions for nature, racism, sexism, discrimination. So it makes sense that healthcare professionals would also be interested in SEPA reform. So as, the, as you've said, the cornerstone environmental health legislation, SEPA pulls together and could do a better job still of pulling together all these pieces of health. Um, our doctors see in their patients the impacts of the exposures in, you know, wildfires, um, the exposures, uh, you know, toxic exposures around First Nations uh, communities, um, of melting ice. So they know from their experiences with their patients, and they also know from the science that substances in our environments are implicated in health harms. And so based on this knowledge and as an organization involved in advocacy for better health, and you know, we talk about advocating for better health through protecting the planet, CAPE sees CEPA reform as part of that responsibility. Um, and as I said, you know, the advocacy is not just uh, around SEPA, but also climate legislation, pesticides, fossil fuels, renewable energy, uh, traffic related air pollution, because environmental protection is health protection. And so they're intertwined. We can't think of health without thinking about our environments. Women, children, racialized and Indigenous peoples, workers, all of us living on these lands of Canada, we're all made more vulnerable if we are being exposed to things in, in, in certain environments and the conditions and timing and volume of those exposures also matter. So at CAPE, we recognize we're all entitled to the right to a healthy environment. And we know that strong legal protections can address health realities we're facing today and can prevent ill health and disease in the future. And we see SEPA reform serving in this role. And we think health professionals have a voice that can help to further their, that project and, and help write that happy ending to the, the story of SEPA, the long story of SEPA. <laughs> I appreciate that. And I really enjoy, I really like the way in which um, sort of all of these different aspects tie in to the whole, that sort of more holistic way of, of viewing it, I think is really important and, and brings me back actually to some of the things David was saying at the beginning around how this really comes from a, an indigenous, from indigenous law uh, often has that uh, much more, um, the idea of environment in relation to, uh, to individuals, uh, to health, to, uh, animals and, and all of the different aspects uh, of life are all kind of connected. And, and I think, um, so SEPA reform is one exciting uh, avenue, but just generally in, in the right to a healthy environment, uh, David, I wonder if you can speak a bit about how the, the legal recognition of that right can make a difference on the ground. And are there some concrete examples um, in terms of what that would look like and how that rolls out? Yeah, well, I would love to talk about this. I could tell you examples from all over the world, but you know, in looking at uh, a, about a hundred countries that have in incorporated this right, what we find is it's not a magic wand that instantly solves all the problems, but it is a catalyst for stronger environmental laws and policies, improved implementation and enforcement of those laws and policies, 
higher levels of public participation. And most importantly, the thing that really matters is it leads to better environmental outcomes. So countries that have recognized this right have reduced air pollution more quickly. They've reduced greenhouse gas emissions more quickly. They've delivered safe drinking water to higher proportions of their populations. And you know, I've done this research uh, and it's been replicated by people who are much more uh, capable of doing sophisticated statistical analysis. So economists from the United States, for example, have published articles concluding that there's a causal relationship that recognition of the right to a healthy environment causes Im improved environmental outcomes. And if you want examples, I mean, they're legion. I could give you examples from Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, Norway, but two of my favorites are Costa Rica and France. So Costa Rica recognized this right in the early 1990s at a time when their country was suffering from severe deforestation. Less than one quarter of Costa Rica still had forest cover as of the early 1990s, but they recognized the right to a healthy environment. And that was a catalyst for the transformation of Costa Rican society. So they put in place a carbon tax, one of the first in the world, and they used the revenues from the carbon tax to pay indigenous peoples, peasants, and other rural residents to restore the forests on their land. And so now 30 years later, over half of Costa Rica has forest cover and they've protected almost 30% of their entire country in national parks. They've passed laws that prohibit open pit mining and prohibit offshore oil and gas development. Those laws have been challenged by industry and the courts in Costa Rica have said the government is doing its job in protecting people's right to a healthy environment. So Costa Rica now gets over 98% of its electricity from renewable sources. You know, in Canada, we're at about 70. So Costa Rica is a tremendous example of the power of the right to a healthy environment. And then maybe a little closer comparison to Canada is France, where France first recognized this right in 2004. And since then has really become a global environmental leader, becoming the first country in the world to pass a law banning fracking, the first country in the world to pass a law banning all uses of the bee killing neonicotinoid pesticides. Uh, they've passed a, a, what they call a duty of vigilance law, which requires all French corporations to do human rights and environmental due diligence in their, across their entire supply chain in every country in which they operate. And most recently, France passed a law which prohibits French companies from exporting pesticides to other countries unless those pesticides are approved for use in France. And then the, last, the most recent thing France is doing is they're leading the high ambition coalition for people and nature, which has a goal of protecting 30% of the Earth's lands and waters by 2030. And guess who their partner is? It's Costa Rica. Those are the two co-chairs of the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. So there's a tremendous track record of the right to a healthy environment, pr producing better environmental outcomes. And that's what we need so desperately in Canada to address these environmental injustices that Dr. McDonald and Dr. MacArthur have spoken so eloquently about today. That is so inspiring. I, um, I'm really excited to see where we go here with the right to a healthy environment, uh, given that, you know, these are sort of, this is a possibility, the, the realm of possibility uh, that we get into when we start talking about this. So thank you so much for that overview and for those great examples. And uh, I guess I'd like to turn to Elaine now and, and uh, just recognize that getting to this point where we're really on the cusp of this um, exciting new era, potentially in environmental law, has been a long journey. And uh, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to the um, to that journey. Uh, how did we kind of get here? And and importantly, and you know, yeah. what's the role for eco justice for our partners, for our supporters uh, in this campaign? Well, David was there in the early days too of this journey when we were um, negotiating. So I, 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 so this this right is a rec, is only going to apply under SEPA, and that is something I think we need to recognize. And as David said in the outset, we need it to be in our charter, we need it to, or in all of our legislation. You know, it, this is just a a crack, a door opening that's going to help, but it's certainly not going to give us the type of protection that. David was talking about in France or Costa Rica. I wish, you know, like, wow, still lots of work to do. So SEPA is a start. Um, and just the story of SEPA alone was quite, a, you know, it was quite, a, it's quite a, a long journey just to get to this point. Um, back in 2016, the government hadn't reviewed the Canadian Environment Protection Act and, well, they had reviewed it, but they hadn't amended it in like, whatever, 15 years. 
Um, we had a new government in Ottawa, so they, the House of Commons Committee on the Environment decided to dig in and do a review of SEPA, and we were lucky that they decided to do that on the outset. We jumped in with both feet to participate in that review, and that review resulted in, a, in 87 recommendations to strengthen SEPA, many of them relating to the right to healthy environment, thanks to submissions from people like David, from EcoJustice, David Suki Foundation, all these organizations that have been working and campaigning around this right for some time in various forums. Um, so then we, so then once we had that report, we celebrated, we thought, great, now we can go ahead and get the government to introduce a bill. And then we waited and we waited and we talked a lot. We had a lot of meetings with government officials, a lot of meetings with people in Ottawa, a lot of pushing, a lot, you know, lots of action alerts and campaigning and all kinds of work. David probably wrote a million op-eds to try and get the government to move and introduce the bill. We had some commitments to a bill, but they dragged their feet, honestly. They just, and only introduced the bill this April. We had an election in the interim, we, you know, so finally get the bill and, you know, it's been tabled, which is great. It has some pretty, you know, it's got a few problems. It needs some strengthening and we're gonna work on that, but we need the bill to move ahead now. So it has been a long journey and it's been a journey that I've traveled with many people. Um, but you know we're we're at a point now where at least we've got um, we've got some language in the bill and we need to make it law. We'll see if we um, you know there's some concerns that we're going to have an election and the bill will die and then we'll have to get it reintroduced again. But um, you know we've been we've been through this long enough now that we know exactly what we need to do to keep the pressure on. But it has been it, it you know there was a, there was. David can speak to this too. There was a lot of resistance in the early days to recognizing the right to healthy environment under SEPA. A lot of resistance. Um, we were we were told no at first, quite clearly from the government that they weren't going to do this. And I just think it took a lot of persistence, a lot of meetings, and a lot of explaining. And then kind of Canada show, you know, Canada falling far behind the rest of the world, as David's already described, to get the government to turn around on this. And and uh, you know, congratulations that they finally did. You know, I don't want to. I'm I'm glad that they've finally have taken these steps, but um, mm -hmm. now we need to see it through to the through to the finish line. Absolutely. I think congratulations to everyone. As you say, there's this has been a, a huge shift uh, in the position over time. So I guess my next question is just where do we go from here? And Jane, can you give us an idea of what's next on this? Uh, I think I should start by acknowledging that that journey that Elaine has described that she and so many people have been on have really laid the groundwork for this moment. And, um, you know, I've, I've only come into this recently. Um, and so I am learning through uh, the, all these people who've done this incredible, relentless work uh, trying to get to where we are now. And I, I'm persuaded and committed and convinced that this is the fight that we need to have at this moment. So where do we go from here? I think we need to continue to do the work to strengthen and support SEPA, like Elaine just described. There are certain pieces that we need to have, you know, some forward movement on. Um, I think this is our best chance at this moment to see the right to a healthy environment recognized along with a revamped approach to toxics and disproportionate impacts on vulnerable populations. But there are many steps yet to come before Bill C-28 can become law. So we need to be engaging with our MPs, with political parties, with the public, and prioritize proceeding with SEPA reform, strengthening it with these key amendments for a SEPA that recognizes modern day exposures and impacts. Um, we need solid environmental health protection. So this is a, the introduction of this bill is a critical step forward. It's worth celebrating. It begins to address necessary changes but as we know, current environmental conditions and impacts from climate change and other contemporary exposures are without a doubt having human and ecological health impacts and people living and working and playing and growing in Canada need to have the right to a healthy environment uncompromised by economic interests. So we need to convey these messages uh, to our publics, to our politicians and if we are to have an election moving forward, you know, we, we need to be pressing on this idea that uh, we need to uphold principles of environmental justice, which includes avoiding adverse uh, impacts and disproportion, disproportionate effects on, on women and racialized people, on the Indigenous peoples who live on this land uh, and have stewarded this land long before us. Um, 
We need to push on the issues that, you know, we need to be assessing substances and consider not only ecological impacts, but as Elaine said, the introduction that's new to this is the human health impacts, including cumulative and synergistic impacts. Uh, we need to account for these real life conditions, the social determinants of health that I talked about. So I think we just need to keep pushing uh, to, to get this long thought for piece of legislation into law. We need to have the political will, we need to have the public awareness of it. Um, and we just, we need to work together to proceed with legislative reform of SEPA to prevent exposure to toxics and pollution and recognize that everyone living in Canada has the right to a healthy environment. That's, um, I think that's what we're, we're all here for. We have, you know, well over 200 folks on this uh, webinar today, and I hope that we have the opportunity to all work together to uh, make sure that this, this gets passed into law and, and keep pushing the right to a healthy environment so we can see the future that, that David so beautifully illustrated for us. Um, so there's a number of different questions coming up. I, I'm gonna start with one from Travis here. Thing. Uh, so as we have seen with so many of the environmental statutes in Canada's past, the rights or obligations contained in environmental statutes are only good to the extent that they are enforced. So can uh, Dr. Boyd comment on what is needed within Bill C-28 to, and I will open up to everybody, to ensure that its contents are both enforceable and enforced, particularly in light of this uh, balancing of economic and interest that was mentioned earlier. So we'll start with you, David. Yeah, great question, Travis. And this is, of course, a critical issue because if laws aren't implemented and enforced, they're nothing more than paper tigers. Um, so I would say, first of all, it's important for everyone to understand that Canada has a terrible track record when it comes to enforcing environmental laws. Uh, a few years ago, I did a comparison looking at all of the fines that had been levied under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act during the first 25 years that it was in force and comparing that with overdue book fines from the Toronto Public Library. In a single year, the Toronto Public Library issued more fines than the history of environmental fines under SEPA. Now that's changed since I did that comparison for the better, but still that gives you a sense of where we're at. And so one of the changes, one of the amendments I think we need to make to Bill C-28 is to have some kind of citizen enforcement mechanism. This has pro proven to be incredibly effective in the United States and other countries where it's found. And that would enable the people of Canada to actually go to court when their right to a healthy environment is being threatened or violated and hold government accountable. And so that's currently not in the bill. And that to my mind is a critical element of strengthening the bill and improving its enforceability. Thanks, Elaine. Did you want to uh, build on that at all? No, it, it, David hit the nail on the head. That is exactly one of the areas that we hope to be able to um, amend when we get the chance is to include a citizen, strengthen and include a citizen for enforcement provision. Um, and we particularly are concerned because there is um, there is some citizen for enforcement provisions in, in the Canadian Environment Protection Act right now, which are, are have never been used because they put so many barriers up to individuals to be able to use them. So what we really want to do is make sure that the and citizens for enforcement provision is done in a way which reduces those or eliminates those barriers so that they can be used more um, you know there's 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 barriers with respect to costs, there's barriers with respect to requiring, you know, certain steps before you can take action on citizens enforcement. And we really want it to be a low barrier, low risk enforcement provision. And that is, that's an aspect of the bill that we intend to be, to work on when we, when we have the opportunity to bring forward amendments. Well, if I can just sort of build on that a little bit, you, you mentioned also this uh, aspect of the balancing of economic interests. And there's a few folks in here speaking a bit about, um, about that and just wondering what that looks like and what kind of amendment we might be looking for. So maybe yeah, we just want that whole section. We just want that whole clause struck out. <laughs> that is what we're seeking, the whole bouncing clause. We want it to be a standalone um, um, requirement and recognition of the right to healthy environment without the balancing clause. Right now, the balancing clause includes that it can be balanced. I can read it. Uh, which right may be balanced with relevant factors, including social, economic, health, and scientific factors. We'd rather if the act just said, protect the right to every, every individual in Canada to a healthy environment as provided for under this act, which is um, what we're hoping to advance. 
the alternative is just to strike the economic word from that, but we would, we want, you know, we, we, we don't want to see um, the right being balanced by economic factors, whatever those may mean under SEPA, because it is not really defined, but doesn't sound like it would be a positive thing that, by any means, so. So, with, you know, there, uh, for people that aren't familiar with how bills work, there's a process where they go to a committee at the House of Commons and people can introduce, people can speak to the bill and encourage parties at the, before, at the committee to introduce amendments. And that's, you know, that is how we will try and get amendments to the bill um, put forward. And that's a great opportunity to, uh, to ask this next question, which is just whether the public is able to participate at committee um, and I guess whether... Uh, and, and this goes into what Jane was speaking about as well, just like how, do, how do, does the public get to participate and, and bring forth and agree with those? If they agree Absolutely, with those. It's, it's, it's part of your democratic right, I believe, to be able to participate. So when the, when the bill makes it to the, House, to the House of Commons Committee for Study, um, they welcome briefs, they welcome witnesses to speak to the bill, to put in their, their thoughts and recommendations. And I would encourage anyone that, you know, does have, you know, pressing amendments or thoughts or, or recommendations with respect to C-28 to, to consider doing that. Um, I don't know when that will happen, <laughs> but um, it will happen after second reading. Once it gets, once it gets debated at second reading, it is, is then sent to the Environment and Sustainable Development Committee for study. And that is at the point where they will welcome people to submit briefs and, and uh, appear as witnesses. Great. All right. The next question. I really like this. So is you can also speak to your MP. Like I can always say, always speak to your MP, right? That's another way of doing email. it too. Yeah. yeah. Especially if your MP oh. happens to sit on that committee, but any, you know, any MP or speak to your, speak to your elected officials about what you want to see happen in C-28 too. I'd say that's another way to hopefully strengthen the bill. Make sure they know that their constituents are, are, are looking for this and looking to ensure that, that it yeah. comes back around. Yeah. Um, great question here from Meg. Is there a distinction between humans' right to a healthy environment and the right of the environment to be healthy? I'm no lawyer, but the right to a healthy environment seems anthropocentric or very anthropocentric. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, do folks want to weigh in on that? I feel like it's a great one for David. <laughs> right. I'm happy to jump in and just say that, yeah, the right to a, it, it is a human right, right? The human right to a healthy environment. It does sound anthropocentric, but what's really surprising and in many ways encouraging is the way that it's been interpreted is healthy for humans, but also healthy ecosystems. And when you think about it, and, and particularly if you bring in an indigenous perspective, those things aren't separate, right? I mean, human yeah. beings share DNA with other every other form of life on the planet. So there is really no separation between humans and nature. We've kind of had this conceit for hundreds of years that we're somehow separate from and superior to nature, but that's, that's not the reality. That's not the biophysical reality. And so in a growing number of countries that what seems like an anthropocentric right to a health, healthy environment is actually being interpreted by courts and governments in a very encouragingly ecocentric way. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add to that? I was just going to say you often hear it described as a right to healthy, um, eco ecologically balanced environment. Often those things will go together when we describe the right to healthy environment. That's not what's being proposed language wise in SEPA, but you know, I, the SEPA has, uh, uh, my sense is that's the interpretation that will happen under SEPA. SEPA already has a lot of strong, lang strong language about protection of the environment. So when you marry those together, I think that's the way you can read it under SEPA. That's great. And um, this sort of builds on that citizens enforcement piece that you were speaking about earlier. Someone's asking, does the act create any positive obligations and or ability of communities who've had their rights infringed to have their right uh, or cause of action against companies to seek damages or injunctions? It does have uh, in the opening sections, it's not, it's in the existing SEPA has something like that now. And that is the tool that I said is very rarely been used because it creates so many barriers to people using it. Um, but there is an existing right for citizens to bring environment protection actions under SEPA right now after they've requested an investigation of the minister for the infraction that they are claiming um, to want to enforce through the environment protection action. And if should the minister, you know, 
or the government, let's put it that way. I use the word minister, but it's really the government um, should, you know, not do a reasonable investigation or not respond to your request for investigation. Then you have a right to take, take on that action yourself against the polluter, if you want to put it that way, or the party that is, that is committing the, 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 um, the, you know, offending act. Um, However, there are so many barriers with respect to costs, with respect to evidence, with respect to people being able to take on these actions themselves, including having to request that investigation that is just not being used. That is why we want to amend the act to kind of put in a low risk, low barrier cause of action for individuals to be able to pursue. That's great. And one of the questions here is for Jane and Elaine um, about which substances are prohibited um, and you know, how do people in vulnerable communities get access to that knowledge about uh, about those substances? So um, in order to perhaps be able to request an investigation or, or in the, you know, look into that for their, their own communities. Yeah, under CEPA, there's something called the toxic substance list, which is the list of all the substances that are in some manner regulated under CEPA. You'll find it if you open up CEPA, it's called Schedule 1, and it lists everything that is basically being in some way restricted, regulated, perhaps banned under CEPA. So that would be how you know, you'd be able to look and see you know, what, what actual substances, and it, it includes greenhouse gases. It, it's recently plastics was added to it. So it is not just about chemicals. It is about a lot of different kinds of substances and, um, that, are, that are listed under, under the Canadian Environment Protection Act. And I think that would be where I would point people to. Um, how those substances are regulated may be very narrow, it may be very broad. That's one thing to be aware of. Just because it's on the list doesn't mean it's prohibited. It may be only regulated in a certain industry or in a certain way, but you know that is the starting point for knowing what is kind of in that big bucket of the Canadian Environment Protection Act is looking at Schedule 1. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, just sort of tying this in to, um, to sort of broader sort of climate crisis, um, folks are talking about a lot right now. Um, is there a way that the SEPA uh, amendments would work towards fighting the climate crisis or be in, you know, be sort of a tool uh, in that direction at all? I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in. I was going to say like a lot of this, a lot of the people don't realize that a lot of the greenhouse gas regulations do actually happen under SEPA, like the industry-based regulations. For example, there was a regulations recently with respect to methane emissions. That was a SEPA regulation. Regulation with respect to coal plant, coal-fired power plants for GHGs was also a SEPA regulation. So when it comes to actually regulating industry for, G, for greenhouse gas emissions, you'll often see those regulations coming out under SEPA. And when we, when I, you know, I talked about the toxic substance list and the your, word toxic on SEPA doesn't mean what you think toxic means colloquially, like as in a poison. Toxic is a substance that's harmful to the environment, harmful to biodiversity, harmful to human health. All those things are considered toxic substances under SEPA. And what the government does is do, does a risk assessment and then decides if that substance meets the threshold to be considered a toxic substance under SEPA, and then they move ahead with the regulation. And they have done that for greenhouse gases. They are listed under SEPA, which opens the door for the government to go ahead and regulate greenhouse gases as they see fit. We could argue that they're probably not doing nearly enough. They need to do a lot more, but there are regulations with respect to, with respect to greenhouse gases under SEPA for sure. And, if, and I don't know yeah, if anyone just, else. I would just jump in there and say that, you know, this issue of climate change litigation is a super exciting one on the international scene. And I think, you know, we've been focused today kind of on the Canadian government and its responsibilities, but I think Canadian courts have to take some responsibility too. The decisions in climate change cases in Canada so far have been disappointingly conservative. And if you look at courts around the world, whether it's Germany's constitutional court, uh, just last week, a court in Belgium, earlier this year, a court in France, a couple of years ago, a court in Netherlands, on and on, court in Australia last month. These courts are using human rights to hold governments accountable to the commitments that they have made internationally, for which there is no enforceable mechanisms under environmental law, right? So Canada has made commitment after commitment to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, broken every single one of those commitments. And a court's role in society, one of a court's role, 
is to hold governments accountable for fulfilling their human rights obligations to their citizens. And so I think it's high time that Canadian courts actually stepped up to the plate, whether it's under SEPA or any other kind of cause of action, and took a look at what their sisters and brothers are doing in courts around the world and started putting a little heat to the feet of the Canadian government to stop talking and actually do the walking about reducing our emissions. It's uh, such an important point. And uh, I know here, uh, the Inu and, and the Nazi would have had a, a really bad year with ice and um, there's you know unpredictable weather and so many direct impacts uh, on the lives and livelihoods of, of many people. Uh, so I think that that's, um, you know, a whole other webinar to get into the, the climate litigation and, and all of that, but a very important topic, absolutely. Um, and I, I'd just like to end with this final question, which I really, uh, I really appreciate. Uh, the, I'm not sure who posted, it's anonymous, but uh, someone asked, where do you find hope in environmental activism? How do you work against fear and discouragement in yourself and others? So uh, who wants to take a first stab at that? I think David wrote a whole book on this. <laughs> I remember going yeah. to a presentation. It's better yeah. for you to say it than me, but because it sounds like self-promotion, but I do yeah. have a book called The and Optimistic it... Environmentalist, which is full of amazing stories of progress on things, everything from ozone depleting chemicals to toxic substances to the recovery of biodiversity, like out my window here. Last night, we had humpback whales in the Salish Sea, which weren't seen here for decades, but I've now made a recovery and are back in these waters. So there are signs of hope. There's also hope to be found in the fact that millions and millions of people around the world are fighting tooth and nail to have their right to a healthy environment recognized and implemented. And then of course, we can't overlook the, the role of young people who have been so inspiring with the Fridays for the Future movement and the climate activism. And so there's, there's a lot of hope out there. Just You just have to avoid things like the CBC and the Global Mail and you'll find lots of hope in other places. Thanks, David. Uh, Elaine, did you wanna go next? Um, yeah, I don't know how, I don't really have anything to add. I like the fight, you know, it's what keeps me going. Um, uh, like one of, I, ha I have seen in some of my own work, I have definitely seen progress. Um, you know, if I, if I think about when I first started working, actually it was with Jane's dad, like. 10 years ago, because he was an activist in the Sarnia area, and we started working on kind of the air pollution chemical effects issues impacting the Amjong First Nation chemical valley in Sarnia. And I wrote a report about the cumulative air pollution in the Sarnia area. And then 10 years later, I updated that report and things had got better. It's still not great. There's still a lot of work to do, but, you know, things had improved. And I think you do we don't often talk about those stories of how things do get better and how, how our actions do produce these results and everyone's actions produce these results. So it's just, it's, it's a slow pace sometimes, but um, I think, you know, that, that's what gives me hope. And then the great people I work with and the wonderful people I meet um, in, in this job every day, it's just, they keep you going. If I could just pick up on a little piece of what Elaine said too, I think it's really important for us to take that long lens and that historical lens. And actually it doesn't even have to be that long. I know in, in some of the, the my academic training, uh, we did history of social movements. And if you look even in the last 40, 50 years in Canada, in North America and in the world, people advocating for something better through hope have made a lot of progress on a lot of issues. If we look at, disability rights, LGBTQ rights. I mean, there are countless examples. I think of the world that I you know, grew up in under the influence of my parents who were feminists, and I'm now raising two daughters. And the way that they talk about as preteen girls, the, the way that they talk about the world and their understanding of the world is very different. It's very easy to get caught up in all the flaws and problems of what I think is you know, very much a result of historical colonial legacies and neo modern day neoliberal governance. But I think that the majority of people 
that we encounter understand that there are certain mechanisms and levers of power that have certain interests that don't necessarily reflect what the majority of us want. So I have hope in looking at what has been achieved and what, and what I think that most people actually want to see for the world that they're living into. Absolutely, I think that uh, it very much reflects my experience in, in terms of I draw so much hope um, both from as sort of as David was saying, the youth and their passion and their depth of knowledge and their activism. Uh, and, and I draw so much inspiration from that as well as from my elders in the environmental movement, uh, many as inspiring uh, folks who are on this call and uh, uh, on this panel, as well as uh, participants and really appreciate uh, everything that you've done and, and that and seeing, seeing that fight and that drive uh, in, in you folks really helps to drive me for sure. So, and I'm sure many of the participants were listening in tonight and I see that Carolyn's come, come on to drag us all off stage. <laughs> thank you. It's the very so gentle much. hook. No, I, I <laughs> want to thank you, Caitlin, David, Elaine and Jane for the conversation today, um, for sharing your knowledge and inspiring us, um, uh, thank you for ending on that really positive note. Um, I also want to thank everyone who has called in uh, and joined us today. As you've heard, EcoJustice and our partners, CAPE, and our other partners on this uh, Right to a Healthy Environment work, uh, we're going to be keeping the pressure on the federal government to modernize the Canadian Environmental Pr uh, Protection Act to bring it into the 21st uh, century and to make sure that it meaningfully recognizes the right to a healthy environment. Um, EcoJustice's legal expertise you know, really uniquely positions us to advocate for stronger, more effective laws that protect people and the environment. Um, but we don't do this work in a vacuum. Uh, we will send you calls to action asking you to speak up. And I really encourage you to do so. It makes a difference. There is power in our collective voices. And I'm, I'm going to leave it there. But thank you again for making time today to be with us. I wish you uh, a wonderful afternoon and evening. And take good care. We'll see you again next time. <laughs>